Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Mark Levy, and you are in for an amazing conversation about differentiation. I promise you at the end of this podcast, you have a clear ideas and the four steps to differentiate your business. Enjoy the conversation with Mark Levy. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meaning podcast. And today, we're going to speak about differentiation with... I don't know anyone in the world that uh, is the best to do that. He is really the expert in differentiation. He has worked with people like Simon Sinek, Marshall Goldsmith. He has a book called Accidental Genius. And uh, it's about using writing to generate your best ideas, insight, and content that has been translated in, I believe, 11 languages. He's created magic show that uh, rated even better than Hamilton in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Mark Levy. Mark, thank, thank you so you. much for being here today. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm honored that you would ask me. Thank you. That's uh, absolutely amazing what you've done. But before we get into that, I know you were in books before. So wh wh what is your journey? What people uh, should know about uh, your professional journey? Yeah, so a couple of things are actually pretty important to know. So what I do, as you know, I'm a differentiation expert, right? I come up with people's big, sexy idea, the thing that they're going to put at the fore of their business and lead with, like the thing that's going to get them to be picked over someone else. And so it's not like I'm so talented at finding that kind of thing naturally. It's that I have put in more work and hours and effort on it than a lot of people so years ago, I was the director of the third largest book wholesaler in the world. We sold, I helped them sell over a billion dollars worth of books. So we'd buy millions of dollars worth of books from Random House, Simon & Schuster, and so forth, the publishers. And then we'd sell them to independent bookshops and chain bookstores and so forth. And what that was was predominantly phone sales. So I would have to pick up the phone and start with zero money. And I'd have to end the call with $200 or $2,000 or $20,000. And I did that. I construed that I did over 25,000, over 25,000 live pitches for money, where <laughs> I was calling people with nothing. And then I had to leave with money. So when you're pitching like that, like I had to do over and over again for like 14 years or so, you learn a lot about what attracts people's attention and what gets them saying yes and what gets them saying no and what makes them interested and what turns them off, what bores them. Mm -hmm. So I learned through doing in live situations about how to persuade people or how to get them excited about things. The other thing that's important for you to know from my background is I have a background as you, as a magician, right? I've created magic tricks on show and shows that have been on TV. They've been all the, the Las Vegas stage and so forth. And especially my show that I co-created, Chamber Magic, has run for 23 years in New York City. And on TripAdvisor, it's rated higher than even Hamilton. And so when you're a magician, like I am a business strategist, I've worked with the former head of strategy of the Harvard Business School on their strategy. I've worked with the former CEO of Popeyes, the woman who turned Popeyes around when they were failing and then they started to, to succeed big. I've worked with the president of UPS. I've worked like major, major business strategy things. But an important part of that, my magic background is very important in that, where like I know business strategy, but magicians know things that a lot of other people don't know. And one of those things has to do with when you're trying to find a point of differentiation, when you're trying to get people's attention, to get them excited about things, sometimes linear chronological everyday logic does not work. Because if you just stay too logical, you are staying too close to war towards what everyone has already seen before. You know, it's you're only going one or two percentage points to the right or left of what already is. And so it's very hard to carve out a spot in someone's mind 
when they already have these other images in their mind and you're staying so close to these other images. Mm -hmm. So it's super important in order to create differentiation that at times you get very illogical in how you look at things. So what I mean by that, another marketer who I've worked with on a project who I adore, his name's Rory Sutherland. So Rory is big in the UK. He's like the Seth Godin of the UK. He's the head of a division of Ogilvy in the UK. And in one of Rory's books, he talks about the idea of a logic too. And he actually says that when you're too logical, you rob the world of its magic. He mm -hmm. says, when you're too logical, you become too predictable and hackable. Like it is very easy to know what it is that you are going to do and say. So it's very easy for the public or for your marketplace to ignore you when you're too logical. And it's very easy for your competitors to predict what it is you're going to do. And they can be ahead of the game when you start to do something. They already know how to counter it. So that's the problem with being too logical. And by the way, in this same book, Rory talks about that's one of the things that makes these mega entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs and Peter Thiel of PayPal and James Dyson of the Dyson Vacuum. That's what makes them so important to the world. It's because the logic that they use is not logic that would be agreed upon by any committee. So, for instance, no one said, no one asked for an encyclopedia that was 26 million pages long, written by non-experts who don't get paid for their entries. <laughs> but, you know, they came to the market with this and that became Wikipedia. No one was asking for a very complicated, expensive vacuum. It was not an ask. There was nowhere. If you Googled it, it was not going to be anywhere. But James Dyson came to the marketplace. And the final thing I'll say here about Illogic is along these lines that Rory had talked about is years ago, and I really should find this out. I, I say this uh, all the time, but I can't remember if it was Central America or South America, but there was a, a soft drink company in Central America or South America, I can't remember. And they wanted to launch worldwide a soft drink to rival Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And so they hired a marketing firm that did taste tests so that they could get an idea of which they should feature. And the marketing firm came back to them and they said, we've been doing this stuff for years in the food and beverage industry, and we've never seen results like the taste tests we've run with your, with your beverage that you gave us. It was the worst a testing product we've ever done. As a matter of fact, if you look at a word cloud of what the public associated with your drink, the key word, the big word in the word cloud was disgusting. Wow. That people predominantly found it disgusting. And so this company knew that they couldn't launch against Coke and Pepsi in a conventional, we're a refreshing cola kind of way. So they created a new category. They upped the caffeine. They created a new category. They called it an energy drink, and they named it Red Bull. Wow. And in order to back up, and that's a very illogical thing to do, to launch a soft drink worldwide that tested so badly. You know what I mean? Like you could say, that's nuts. Like that doesn't make any sense. You're right. So they needed to use a different kind of logic in how to approach it. So they did things like they didn't sell it in two liter bottles because something that strong, an energy drink, you couldn't drink two liters. Right. So there's no such thing as a two liter of it. So they put it in these little cans. They were hard to crush. They started sponsoring all kinds of extreme sports because this was supposed to give you extreme energy. They sponsored all kinds of publicity stunts like having someone skydive from outer space. They started yeah. in the atmosphere. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the attrition guy, I remember. Right, right. And they, all that stuff was because their drink tasted as disgusting and they had to become illogical 
in Bum order to Gar- boom Gartner, I think was his name. Right, 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 right. It, it was it was insane. I remember watching that. It was totally insane. You were talking that selling so many uh, for a uh, billion dollar worth of books, coming with all those ideas. What is your process? And what would you advise business owners to do if they're looking at their differentiation to uh, position their business or or basically that their customer will remember them? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So in trying to come up with a point of differentiation, one thing that very few people do, but that I do, I approach differentiation. I have a background not just as a magician and a salesperson and so forth. I have a background as a writer. I have a degree in writing. And as a matter of fact, I've written for the New York Times. I've written for a show that was on Netflix and so forth. I've done lots of, I taught writing at Rutgers University. So when you're a writer, let's say you have to write a 500-word article. And this is going to be appropriate to everyone listening. Like, So listen up. If you have to write a 500-word article for a prominent newspaper or website or whatever it is that you're writing for. Most professional writers, the last thing they would do is to write 500 words. Because if you're trying to write 500 words for a 500 word article, every word has to be too dear. Like you become too perfectionistic. Everything Mm -hmm. has to be right. Professional writers, we have to create too quickly to be that perfectionistic about things. So what it is we do is to write a 500-word article, I might start by writing 5,000 words or at least 1,500 words or something like that. In other words, you write fast, you write loose, you try different approaches to the idea, you approach it from different angles, you know what I mean? And then you edit it down to the 500 words. That's how most writers write, even under deadline. It's a very common way uh, to write. So the reason why I bring that up is I find when people try to differentiate, they try to come up with the quote unquote right answer too quickly. So when you try to come up with the right thing very, very quickly, you almost always stay in a field of mediocrity. Mm -hmm. You almost always stay with boring choices that other people are already using, and you're just coming up with a variant of what it is that's already being used. So a much better way is to kind of write the 5,000-word version of the 500-word article. The first step of the process, I have a four-step process to differentiate. The first step, which is super important, is the discovery step. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be collecting ideas and insights and stories and just all kinds of things that you think speak to what it is that your product or your service or your life is about. And you're putting them like in a Word document, or if they're physical objects, you put them in a box. And by the way, sometimes with my my clients, I'll often send them out into the world in order to gather things. Like I'll say, I want you to go to a bookstore And I want you to come back with five books that for some reason speak to what it thinks your brand, you think your brand represents. And by the way, these books don't have to be in your category, like Mm -hmm. could be in the events space business. And you might come up, come back with a biography of Taylor Swift, you know, like that's fine. Or you might come up with something about medieval history. And but as long like you start collecting this stuff and then we go over it, we look at it and we start looking for ideas and themes. And so things that come up from what it is that you have created, because often the important thing in what you're doing, it's often something that you're not paying a lot of attention to. It's like almost a sidebar of a conversation. I'll give you an example. I was working with a a client of mine, Lisa McLeod, and Lisa had been a sales trainer for Procter & Gamble, and she went out on her own to teach sales, and she hired me to differentiate her, and we started talking about normal sales stuff. And so to me, that kind of stuff is, I know about it, it's terribly interesting to, to differentiate around. And so 
what I try to do is I try to get people to go far afield, like to go to the edges of where. So I started to ask Lisa things about her background and her life and her beliefs. And she was talking about the Unitarian Church and how she had preached at the church. And she talked about how John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were Unitarians and they hated each other, but they put aside their differences in order to create the Declaration of Independence like something bigger. And she was talking about that. And in the middle of this conversation, she stopped just for a second. She said, you know, what I really want to do is restore the nobility to the sales process. And then she just continued to talk. Like, I didn't say, you know, it's like she just continued to talk. And at the end of it, I said, okay, Lisa, you don't train people on other people's sales methodologies. You train them on your own sales methodology. Your own sales methodology is called selling with noble purpose. Here's how you came up with selling with noble purpose. Here are the precepts of selling with noble purpose, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, she wrote bestsellers on it, selling with noble purpose, leading with noble purpose, all this stuff. Like it became, that would be an example. The reason why I bring that up was not an important part of the conversation, but it came from an important place. Like I could tell what you, you know, what I really want to do is restore the nobility to the sales profession. Mm -hmm. that, you know, like continuing to talk. It's like, okay, I got it. Like that makes sense to me. Uh, anyway, does that make sense? Uh, what it is I'm saying, Aaron? Yeah, totally, totally. And uh, you know, my ADD takes me uh, sometimes in, in places when you say MacLeod and said, okay, there could be only one. But yeah, uh, that's an, another movie for that. Oh, right. So that's right. Oh, right. Sure. I know what you're talking about. The first phase is uh, discover. Oh, yeah. So there's the, you want to discover, and that takes the longest time. You have to collect all this stuff that may or may not end up being part of your brand. Yep. Then the second phase is where you mine everything that you've created for associations and for meaning. And you will find meaning. Trust me. Edward Tufte from Yale, the guy who wrote Visual Display of Quantitative Information, said that the act of organizing becomes an act of insight, that just by moving things around, human beings see patterns and important things start appearing to them. So if you've done your due diligence, you're like putting all that great stuff together in the discovery phase, which I call uh, the Schlitz beer phase. I didn't tell you what I call my phases. The discovery phase is the Schlitz beer stage. Then the next phase is the Barbie stage. And that's where you look at things for associations and meanings. And you find the thing that's most meaningful. And then the third stage is the Captain Inferno stage, where you write your compelling story about what the thing is about. And then the fourth stage I call the Philip Crosby stage, which is about practicing what your point of differentiation is in all its different increments and so forth. But okay. really what differentiation is about, I have a uh, an elevator speech format that I had created, which really uh, like this speaks to what differentiation is about. So you know what an elevator speech is, right? Yeah. Someone says, what is it that you do for a living? And so you first, the trouble that people have is that they invariably try to be too fancy right away. They try to say something really imaginative. It's like, oh, yes, I'm a, a sales Sherpa with, and like, no one wants to hear that stuff. Like, you're asking them to do work on your behalf, and they don't even know who you are yet. So they want to define you. They want to pigeonhole you, and you want to let them pigeonhole you. But it's this idea of, like, let's say you run a leadership consultancy, but this works for products too. I'm just picking stuff that works. You would say, oh, I'm a, a leadership consultant. I work with companies like Apple and eBay to help them with their leaders. But I do leadership in a very unusual way, right? That's the summation of the differentiation field in a in a. It's like, oh, here's the category. Like, oh, what is this restaurant? 
You want to let them know it's a Mexican restaurant. You don't want to hide that from people. You don't want to say, oh, there's a lot of Mexican restaurants. They got to know. Don't fool around with them. Like, don't BS them. So, but then if they've come into your Mexican restaurant, now they're willing to listen to how your Mexican restaurant is different from others. So it's the idea, here's the category I'm in, but I do this, and here's some of the people I work with, but I do this stuff very differently. And then if they say, oh, wow, how do you do that? Like, what's a, then it would be, well, here's how most people operate in that field. But that makes a lot of problems for this reason and this reason and this reason. Really, the best way to operate in this field, and then you tell them how you operate, and then you say how you're the expert in that field. Does that make sense? So it makes, it, makes total sense. Yeah, yeah you are the point. Mm. I'm really in all that stuff. Oh, I'm this. I work with companies like so and so, but I do that kind of thing in a, in a very unusual way. Yeah. Oh, how? Well, here's how other people normally do it. And that creates this problem, this problem, and it's even worse than you could imagine, like blah, 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 blah. So the way to do it in that field is to do it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's how I do it. So if you notice in all that stuff, I am starting in the listener's universe. Like the problem that I find people have when they try to differentiate is sometimes they'll come up with really great points of differentiation or really imaginative points of differentiation or unusual points of differentiation, but they start where they are. Like the other person is interested in solving some kind of everyday yet important problem, you know, something really important. So you start with that, you know, like, oh, what do you do? Oh, well, I, I'm a lead generation company. I help medium-sized businesses generate leads, but uh, we do it in a, in a really unusual way. I work with places like so. It's like, oh, how do you do that? Well, and you know what I mean? You start where they are. You talk about the problems that they would have. Mm -hmm. And then if they're interested, because they might not be interested, but if they're interested, then you lead them into your universe because Brilliant. now they'll listen. Brilliant. If you yeah. started with your universe, they're not going to listen. Uh, totally. Uh, Mark, you, you mentioned your four faces and you mentioned the names of the four faces. I've heard from you the Schlitzberg beer story and the Barbie story. Do you, do you mind sharing this uh, with people listening? Oh, yeah. Well, so the information gathering stage, I call the Schlitz beer story. And so here's the Schlitz beer story. So about 115 years ago or so, there was a very famous advertising man named Claude Hopkins. And Claude Hopkins got a call from the head of the Schlitz Brewery. And the guy from the Schlitz Brewery said, Mr. Hopkins, there are eight big breweries in the United States. And on that list of eight big breweries, we are number eight. We are in last place. We need your help. And Claude Hopkins said, I'm positive I can help you. I'm certain of it. In order to help you, though, I'm going to have to take a tour of your brewery. And the guy from Schlitz said, Mr. Hopkins, I don't think you're going to find much if you take a tour of our brewery. But if that's a condition of hiring you, it's a very easy one to grant. You're in Chicago. We're in Milwaukee. Just hop on a train, right? Like 1910 or so. Just hop on a train and come here. And we're happy to give you a tour of the brewery. And Claude Hopkins did just that. And what he saw at the Schlitz Brewery astonished him. The very first thing they showed him in the brewery was an artesian well 3,000 feet deep. The reason why they went that deep, Schlitz told him, was they wanted to make the purest beer on earth. And they thought if they stayed too close to the surface, there'd be too many impurities there. So they went deep down into the earth to get to the purest water. And by the way, an artesian well means that the water was spouting out of the earth like a geyser of pure water. And Hopkins was very impressed with this, was very startling. And then they showed him a machine that triple steam cleaned every bottle before they poured the Schlitz beer into it. Again, if they started off with 
pure water and made a pure beer, they didn't want to introduce impurities in the bottling process. So triple steam cleaned. And then they showed him underground, under lock and key in a vault, what Hopkins wrote in his book, Scientific Advertising. He called it a single mother yeast cell. It was a single cell that it had taken Schlitz brewers and scientists 1,017 experiments to create this single mother yeast cell. This thing was essentially the great, 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 great grandmother all time of every bottle of Schlitz. So every bottle of Schlitz that ever had been made and every bottle of Schlitz that ever would be made would taste like this thing, right? They had, That's how they programmed it to be. And Hopkins was standing just a few feet away from this thing, and he was freaking out. And he said, oh, my God. He said, this place is a wonderland. Why aren't you telling people about all these wonders? And the head of Schlitz said, Mr. Hopkins, I told you you wouldn't understand. You wouldn't get anything being here. And you haven't. You don't understand. This place is not a wonderland. These are not wonders. This is how you brew beer at scale. This is how we brew beer, and this is how our seven other competitors, we all do the exact same thing, identical. As a matter of fact, if I blindfolded you and put you in a car, you know, whatever, and drove you around, and we went to other breweries, like, and had them cover up the signs or so, you'd be very confused as to where you actually are, because we're all so alike. So what we're doing here at Slits is nothing special at all. What we're doing here is very, very ordinary. And Claude Hopkins, the famous advertising man, said, well, maybe, but the public doesn't know about that. Oh, so boy. Hopkins proceeded to write a series of long advertisements detailing every single thing he saw, detailing the 3,000-foot artesian well, triple steam cleaning bottle machine, brewer scientist, all that and more. He put into these advertisements, and they published them in places like the Saturday Evening Post. And in under a year, Schlitz went from being number eight in America to being tied, at least for number one. So to me, the moral of that story is what is ordinary to you may be extraordinary to your marketplace if they only knew about it. So as you're putting this list together, like all this stuff of the things that you feel might make you special, it's very important that you also put down things that are obvious because sometimes what is obvious to you is this lightning bolt to the marketplace. They just have never heard of it before. So when I'm talking to people, sometimes uh, they feel boxed in. They don't know what to talk about because they're looking to be really smart and they're looking to be really accomplished or so. And doing that kind of stuff too early from a standstill shuts people down. So invariably, I ask them, you know what, like, forget about being clever about this. Just tell me what's obvious about your brand or your company. Mm. And they say, what do you mean by obvious? I said, I don't know where you're located, how many customers you have, how you make what it is you make, why you price it that way, where you are in the marketplace, who your customers are, like, like, just give me like the kindergarten version, like don't make it too smart. And invariably, if you let the faucet run, if you let people start to talk about things that are obvious, almost invariably, they come up with insights. They don't have to, but they invariably, they go, you know, I've never looked at it this way before. Mm -hmm. I've heard that. I've been doing this since 2001. I have heard that hundreds of times in my life. They'll be talking and talking. They'll say, you know, I never thought of it this way before. But so that has to do with lowering your expectations and just talking about what's obvious. Another way to talk about this, I read once in a book on writing, right? Because I love to write. A guy named Ken McCrory once talked about when you, if you're stuck in trying to write something, just start listing one fact after another fact. In other words, you're not trying to get lucky with a quote unquote great thought. You are just listing fact after fact after fact, and it has a calming influ and a grounding influence on you. And invariably, you start to come up with good ideas eventually because you know you're not intimidating yourself. You're lowering the the fence, right?
you know, you don't have to jump over like a 15 foot wall. It's, you know, more like a two inch wall. You know, that's what you're doing. It's like, so it, it's much easier. That, I love, I've loved the story of the, the Schlitz beer. So that is the discovering phase. And then the mining phase, you call it the Barbie phase. Yeah, well, the Barbie phase, when you start, and I actually, unfortunately, I don't have, I have to read from paperwork for this, but I'll tell you what, what it is exactly. Normally, I quote from a, a source from Fast Company magazine, but you have to find an idea, a single idea, and you have to commit to it, and you have to go all in on it. It's like what Ted Levitt from the Harvard Business School for in the Harvard Business Review in 1960, he wrote an article called Marketing Myopia. And at myopia, as in you can only see up close, you can't see far. And it was in that book that he said, he's the one who coined the, uh, the idea of, you have to ask yourself, what business am I really in? And so an example, and this is not from Levitt's thing, this is from another gentleman's thing, a guy named Tyreman. Tyreman talked about if you run a bed and breakfast, you could say that you're in the hospitality business. And that would be true. But you would have all these competitors because there's a lot of people with bed and breakfasts and they're in the hospital. But it's much better to list all the ideas that your business could represent, could mm. Doesn't mean that it will, but it could. So for instance, you might want your bed and breakfast to represent relaxation, or you might want it to represent escapism, or you might want it to represent romance. So each one of those things you would take and you would say, if I did my bed and breakfast entirely around relaxation, what could I do? Like maybe you would have white noise machines in every room. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you would have, I don't know, like someone playing the harp coming in at night at like nine o'clock playing the harp or something like that. If you sold out to escapism, what could you do? I once asked, I was giving a speech and I asked someone what they would do. And someone said, oh, I'd make sure that there was no cell service there. Escape, as in you can't reach anyone and no one can reach you. That would be one thing. What happens if your bed and breakfast was in the romance business? So what you could do, you could have red bedspreads with red walls. You could have rose petals on the bed. You could have moonlit walks planned. You could have one of my clients said that they would have mirrors on the ceiling. If they sold out to romance, you could, right? You could do all these different things. So what it is you're trying to do with your point of differentiation is you're trying to take what this thing is that's going to make you different and mm -hmm. what it symbolizes, what it represents, and you're trying to go all in on that. And the reason why I call it the Barbie step, I recently obviously named it the Barbie step like a few months ago. And it's because I read an article in Fast Company magazine, and they were quoting the, I think he was, the, he's the COO of Mattel. I could be wrong. Maybe he's the CEO, but his name is Richard Dixon. And Richard Dixon essentially said, we've been planning the Barbie movie for 10 years. Huh. We just start. We've been planning it for 10 years. And we're tired of being in the toy and game business. It doesn't mean they're not staying in that business. They are. But that's like being in the hospitality business. In other words, we're tired of being like that's the only we're marginalized in that. We want to expand out. And so he literally says Mattel is in the pop culture business. So and they have actually operated as if they were in the pop culture business. So what that means is for the Barbie movie, they had screenwriters write a script for it that was all about role types in today's society. It starts in the Barbie world, then it moves to our world. And so they did that on purpose. They didn't have to have something like that. And it's because they wanted the Barbie movie to be a lightning rod place to start conversations about 
societal roles. Brilliant. And right. And so Mattel has something like 45 properties in the pipeline for movies, including I think 13 that have been green lighted or already like, like he man and rock'em sock'em robots and all their stuff is about cultural relevance and pop culture. That's why, for instance, with the Barbie movie, when it came out, they had something like 165 partners. That's yeah. why you can see progressive insurance ads that would talk about the Barbie movie during the ad. That's because Mattel wanted to be in the pop culture business. Yeah, so they went far afield. And that's why this te uh, tells it like nothing else. If you remember when the Barbie movie came out, the film Oppenheimer about yep. the nuclear bomb was coming out at the same time from a different studio. Yeah. So in a very 20, in a very modern day way, what Mattel decided to do is we're going to call that weekend Barbenheimer. Brilliant. It's not, and I would never have seen this happen in any other time since I've been alive. Most other film studios would ignore another movie coming out, or they reschedule the weekend theirs was coming out, or they would dismiss what it is. They do one of those things. Because, but because today, an important word is about inclusion of different types. So they were saying, Barbenheimer, this is the weekend you need to go see. But this is one company saying this, saying, you need to go see both films, even though that film's not ours. Like, they're both really important. You need to be, like, in the center of what's happening. Barbenheimer, yeah. you got to see them both. That's like, brilliant. That's very, brilliant. So, but, but all that came from asking themselves, what business am, are we really in? And they decided, we want to be in the pop culture business. That's brilliant. what it was about. So, Mark, I, I know you're a uh... You have a deadline in the time now. Right. Uh, so you, you have the first phase, discover, the second phase, mining. Just just name again the, the last two phases. Uh, Captain Inferno, which is about writing your compelling story. I can't yeah. go into that right now. And then the last one is Philip Crosby. Philip Crosby is actually the man who invented the concept of the elevator speech. So okay. I have a lot to say about him and using that. But uh, awesome. anyway. Yeah. Awesome. Listen, th thank you so much for taking the time. I know you told me you had the deadline, but my last question. Yes, please. What do you advise people to read or to do to inform themselves? So that, for instance, people in the meetings and event industry are usually always looking at example of meetings and event industry and what others are doing in the meetings and event industry instead of like the Medici effect that they're looking at other industries. So what do you advise them to read or to do and what do you do? Oh, I would for certain, I would have them go around and look at businesses and brands that are not in your industry. And I would talk to myself about why I like those, like what is each brand trying to do? You know, like when you're going shopping. I mean, I do this in the supermarket. I walk around and I say, oh, that's interesting. These different types of oatmeal, how are they differentiating each other? I mean, you know, like toothpaste. Oh, this one's tartar control. This one's whitening. This one has breath freshener. This one, you know what I mean? You start to walk around and you start to see what different brands and different companies are doing. And you start to take notice about what it is that you like. And then you start to ask yourself, how could I do that? That would just be one thing. I have dozens and dozens and awesome. dozens of things. But that it's being aware of what other people are doing, particularly outside your field. Brilliant. Mark, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. I know, unfortunately, you have uh, another time deadline, but uh, how do people get in touch with you? Oh, yeah. So my website is levyinnovation.com. That's L-E-V-Y innovation.com. And uh, my email is mark with a K at levyinnovation.com. They can always email me. I get back to people pretty quickly. Yeah, that's true. I'm happy. If anyone has any thoughts or something that they were uncertain about listening to this, just email me and I'm happy to get back to them. Wonderful. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time with me today. Eric, thank you. And thanks everyone for listening.
Mark, thank you so much for uh, all your insights. And uh, as I was telling you, I like the fact that uh, you have so many great stories to share. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you ask questions, people just say, yes, uh, that's a little difficult, but I love your stories and thank you very much for sharing them with me today. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to connect with me, please go on LinkedIn or join the Facebook group www.eventbusinessformula.com slash group. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your network. Thank you. Bye-bye.